Welcome to Rational Alchemy. Today's going to be rather interesting because it's actually going to be rational therapy. And boy, do I need therapy. I am joined here at Brett Bannerman's house. Brett is, is one of America's leading sound engineers and also a musician on the side, he told me. So that's kind of interesting. So we're in a little bit of a different location. I'm joined today by Faith. Faith, welcome. Thank you, Nigel. I'm so happy to be here. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about what you do and how you do it? Yeah. Uh, I'm a licensed professional counselor and board certified music therapist with a private practice here in Longmont called Soundwell Music Therapy. And I work with teens, young adults, adults um, who are dealing with mental health issues that um, they're interested in finding other ways to work through besides just traditional talk therapy. It's kind of interesting because uh, I did a little bit of research, obviously, as I always do, and I was amazed at the number of topics that music therapy can actually help. And I'll, I'll, give a, a, I'll let you go in depth on these, but uh, re reduce anxiety and pain. I'd never thought of music therapy to help with pain. That, that's a really interesting one. Improve mental health. That one I did, I did know about. But I, I was actually surprised that these are actually scientifically proven to work. So this is not one of your woo-woo woo things. This is, this is real. Um, and there are other benefits as well, like memory. It can actually help memory, which means I need a lot of music <laughs> therapy. Um, <laughs> Why don't we look into a few of those you know, subtopics and talk a little bit about them. Where would you like to start? Well, um, I think maybe a good place to start would be on how music therapy can assist with anxiety, since that seems to be a common thing that so many of us are experiencing. And part of the way that music therapy and I guess you could say music in general can help with anxiety is the multi-dimensional impacts that music has on us neurologically, physiologically. Music can affect our breathing, can promote deeper breathing, it can help our thoughts to settle, it can help us to identify and express the emotions that we may be feeling that are underlying the anxiety. So for to give a more concrete example, in my in my office, I sometimes have people who are living a lot in their heads, as one tends to do when experiencing anxiety. And so I will offer them an opportunity to play one of the instruments that I have in my office. It might be the ocean drum or it might be a reverie harp, which is this lap harp that mm -hmm. is tuned in such a way that anyone can play it. Even me? Even you. Oh, I find that very hard to believe. And you can feel the vibrations of the oh. instrument in your body. And as people are playing these instruments, they start to become more settled and grounded into their bodies, when, which then helps them to start to talk about what's really going on for them rather than being lost in a wave of ruminating thoughts. It's funny you should mention it in that particular way because I know when I'm feeling a bit down, if I put on, say, Pink Floyd's Echoes from Pompeii, even though what the song is expressing, it, it does, the music calms down. I, I do remember seeing a couple of programs on, uh, about music and how it affects the brain. Mm -hmm. And I found that absolutely fascinating, that just sitting there and listening to music actually changes your psychologically on how you're thinking. Yeah. It, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And because of the ways that music can impact the brain, whether that's listening to recorded music or actively engaging in music making. That's what makes music therapy so potent and relevant in a wide variety of healthcare settings. For example, there are music therapists who are working in NICU settings, working with premature babies and parents and helping to 
helping support these families with children, babies who are in critical, critical condition, condition, helping to reduce heart rate, helping to wow. increase respiration, helping to develop bonding, mm -hmm. which is so important yes. in those early stages and can be difficult to do when you can't be actively holding your child. There are music therapists who work in special education settings. Um, there are music therapists who specialize in working with people on the autism spectrum. There are music therapists who work in rehab settings, so using music as a way to help people recover speech and movement after experiencing a stroke. Some people may remember Arizona Representative Gabby Giffords, oh, yes, who much. was shot, and music therapy was a huge part of her rehabilitation process. Wow. I had not heard that. Yeah, yeah. And then there are music therapists who work specifically in memory care, uh, working with older adults who are experiencing um, neurological, mm -hmm. um, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's. And then there are music therapists who work in hospice. That is fascinating. What led you into this type of work? Yeah, well, my undergraduate degree is in vocal performance and vocal pedagogy. And by my senior year, as I was preparing for my recital, I realized that I'm not, I don't have the demeanor and the temperament to be a full-time performer because mm -hmm. it's hard work and requires I discipline. I think I might disagree <laughs> with you on this, but. <laughs> requires discipline that I don't necessarily have. What was fascinating to me about having to learn the music was just the psychological and emotional process that you go through to learn a piece of music, to connect with a piece of music, to then get on stage and perform a piece of music where you have nothing to hide behind because Correct. your voice is you. And then to be able to communicate your intention to the audience and have them respond. And I realized, I would like to support other people in being able to do that, to be able to really embody their voices and to feel confident in speaking their truth. So my voice teacher at the time gave me a brochure for the music therapy program at Naropa University in Boulder. It was part of the Transpersonal Counseling Psychology program. and. Um, after spending a year in South Korea being an expat, I decided to apply to go back to school and... Uh, just, just, yeah. just, just briefly, Yeah. Korea, what were you doing in Korea, for goodness <laughs> sake? And I'm, I'm assuming South Korea rather than North. Yes. Good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was teaching English as a foreign language to young children. I got a job there and it was an amazing experience through that. I was able to sing with a Korean choir where we oh, performed a televised uh, performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. We competed in contests and it was lovely, but at a certain point, um, I developed a respiratory illness that affected oh. the upper range of my voice. Oh dear which then sent me into an existential tailspin. Yes. I had been, up to that point, I had been so identified with my voice, like, who am I if I can't sing? And I took that as a, as a sign from... Whatever. Yeah, exactly, whatever, that it was time for me to find a different direction. And that's when I remembered that I still had this brochure for the music therapy program at Naropa made my little audition videotape that included footage of me playing the piano and singing to a group of Korean kindergartners and doing some improv with my voice and I Do you still have that tape? I would love to see that. <laughs> I really No, would. because I sent it in. Oh. I only had one copy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so um, so that's what brought me to Colorado and when I came to Colorado, I just thought that music therapy was music psychotherapy. You're doing psychotherapy and using music. Mm -hmm. But then I learned that is not the case. It is as broad of a profession as I just described. Right, right. 
Now, we were talking before we started recording the show, and we, we were talking a little bit, and a little bit of research that I did suggested that anyone that thinks they may need this should go and see their practitioner, their, their general practitioner first. And you then said, no, Nigel, that's not true. <laughs> Could you explain that? Yeah, well, it would, I would say that it depends on who you are, what kind of support you're looking for from music therapy. If someone is looking for counseling support, mental health support, people can reach out to me directly because I'm an LPC and I'm LPC? licensed professional counselor. Okay. I'm in network with all of the major insurance companies and Medicaid. Uh, apparently, I'm also in network with Medicare, but I haven't worked all that out yet exactly. Um, but in other cases, uh, for other conditions, it may be more appropriate to talk to your doctor about it because you might need to get a, an authorization mm -hmm. to receive music therapy. So sometimes they, they do need a referral. Sometimes. Or sometimes you do need a referral. Yeah, and, but there's also the Colorado Association for Music Therapy where there's a whole list of music therapists practicing all over the state. And you can also reach out to them. Many of them work with the Medicaid waivers. Okay. And so they, um, they can be contacted to work with families who have um, children who are terminally ill and receiving palliative and hospice care or music therapy services to work with people who have a Medicaid waiver, who have developmental yes. disabilities, which is also another large area that music therapists work in. At a guess, how many music therapists do you think are, say, just in Colorado? Oh, I think the latest number is maybe 200. Wow. There aren't many of us. At this point, uh, Colorado State University is the only music therapy program in the state. I'm currently a PhD student in their music therapy program there. Most excellent. Yeah, yeah. It's been mind-blowing. I bet. Um, and the training, the program currently between their undergrad and their, their master's program, I believe there's about 40 students. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's so, growing. So gradually the numbers are, are getting much, much larger. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, most, of, most of you guys are sort of around the Denver area. Colorado Springs, probably Pueblo, yeah. Fort Collins. Yep, definitely more located in the Front Range. Yes. Um, but there are some music therapists out on the Western Slope. Oh, okay. Um, in Montrose area. Um, in higher up in the in the mountains, mm -hmm. there's a um, there's a music therapist who uh, has a nonprofit that works specifically with veterans. Oh, nice! And um, his his program is based in Vail. Okay, I believe, and they do like retreats and workshops, like right. songwriting type uh, workshops. This is fascinating. This is fascinating. My daughter nearly got into uh, actually art therapy. Ah, oh, nice. Do you ever work with an art therapist? I have. I have in the past. Um, currently, I haven't. But um, prior to the pandemic, um, I had a contract with the St. Vrain Valley School District where I was the music teacher for one of the special ed programs. And they also had an art therapist who was the art teacher, and sometimes we would collaborate. Um, when I graduated in 2007, I did some contract work with Adams Camp, which is a program that every summer they have um, overnight camping experiences for kids with, with developmental disabilities and provides, provides them with a camp-like experience while also mm -hmm. providing therapy and providing their family, parents, siblings with a chance to experience right. being in nature. And so on those teams, it would be often be music therapist, an art therapist, 
a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist. And so sometimes we would collaborate in those ways. And when I was doing my, completing part of my internship with hospice, at that time it was hospice of Metro Denver, um, I would work with an art therapist too, particularly in children's bereavement. I don't think people in America realize how much help is actually out there. It, it's not something you really hear about. And from what, you know, just the brief words that you've spoken, there's a lot of help out there providing you can find out where to go. Yeah, and I would also say that it's provided you have the resources to pay for it. Yes. Because while I can bill insurance as an in-network provider, that's because I'm licensed. Mm -hmm. But music therapy isn't a licensed profession in Colorado or in most of the states. In some states, licensure has passed. And so that that can limit people's access. Some music therapists will create or will create super bills Mm -hmm. and have their clients pay them directly and then they can uh, communicate with their insurance company for out-of-network benefits um, which poses challenges because the insurance company is not necessarily going to pay that person back and services can be expensive. Can be expensive, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. So, let us change just a little bit. Okay. I'm going to become your patient. Okay. Okay? (laughs) And what we're going to do is, we're going to pretend that we have never met. Okay? Okay. And I want you to treat me exactly as you would treat a new patient coming to you saying, can you help me? Okay. Okay? Suffering a bit from depression. Lost a dear friend. Okay? That bit you know. Yes. So, I'm brand new. You've never seen me before. What happens next? What happens next is I would ask you, how are you feeling? What brings you to therapy today? What would you like to work on? Okay. Let me have a think about that. The reason I'm here is a very dear friend died. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm missing him enormously. He was a very important person in my life, and uh, I'm feeling a bit depressed about it all. Mm -hmm. I really am. And uh, I'm not quite sure how to get out of this depression, Mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Now, I do love music, always have done, always will do. Mm -hmm. If I die listening to Pink Floyd, trust me, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Um, what, What else do you need to know? Well, then I would ask you, Are there certain songs that remind you of him, that you would associate with him? The funny thing is, we never actually ever talked about music. Uh I don't know what he liked to listen to. Uh We used to go out and we used to have lunches together, and uh, we talked about everything. I mean, we solved all of the world's problems over lunch. It was not difficult. (laughs) Thank uh, you for your service. (laughs) (laughs) But... uh, No, music is one thing. I don't know what he liked to listen to. Um, Probably some dreadful country and western, actually, but (laughs) we won't go into that. (laughs) Okay. So part of the reason why I would ask if there are certain songs that you associate with him would be to help facilitate the sharing of memories. Understood. Because oftentimes when we have first experienced a loss... It's important to be able to share those stories and to be able to keep that connection mm-hmm. that we that we feel to that person. Okay. But then another thing, if a song wasn't coming to you, something else that I might suggest would be improvising around that feeling. And oh, so okay. making some music together. I wouldn't expect you to necessarily play all by yourself, although sometimes clients do. They want to just be witnessed making music, and then other times there are clients who want that shared support. Okay, okay. I do know that if you hand me a musical instrument, we are going to lose all our viewership because I cannot play a single instrument. 
I have tried and I have tried and I have tried. It's just not how I'm wired. I can sing. Okay. But I can't play a musical instrument. I would question whether or not you could play a musical instrument. I would ask you, what does playing a musical instrument mean to me, mean to you? Like, when you think of playing an instrument, does that mean you have to be performing with a certain level of proficiency? Mm -hmm. Or does it mean like you physically can't move your fingers to play the keys on a keyboard? Okay. I do have a synthesizer at home and I do sit up there and, and see the crazy noises I can get out of this damn thing. And uh, it was, it was a, a Roland 1974-ish. It's one of the very, very earliest synthesizers that we, the general public, could buy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a lot of fun doing that. But putting together a tune? No hope in heck. And I think that's the beautiful thing about improvising is that it doesn't, and imp, I should say, improvising specifically within music, a music therapy mm -hmm. context, is that it's much more about the process rather than the finished product. Okay. And so sometimes I find when I improvise with people that it, one, I think it <coughs> gives people that permission to connect with their creative side, mm. which yeah. we don't give ourselves enough permission to connect with in our society. And was kind of going back to what I said earlier about music and anxiety, it helps people to just become more embodied in the moment where then feelings and thoughts can come up that can then be shared, processed, um, sometimes people will start to cry mm -hmm. because the music, for whatever reason, on whatever level, whatever's going on in the person's mind and heart, has opened the door. It triggers something. Yeah, it's opened the door to allow these feelings to be expressed that wow. need to be expressed. Do you want to try it with me? Are you open to it? I'm, I'm open to anything. Okay. Come on. I'm Perfect. 72 years old. <laughs> I've got nothing to lose. <laughs> and everything to gain. And everything to gain. Let's do that. Sounds good. We will be back in just a second. That was wonderful. Um, I, I love your use of the black keys. That, that was really clever and that was a beautiful set of chords. They're all sort of intermingled and there endeth my musical knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate what you said about the black keys because I find that when I'm improvising with clients that sometimes just having us play on the black keys mm -hmm. makes it feel a bit more accessible because otherwise if it's you have the entire palette of the keyboard available it can feel really overwhelming right so I would like to I'm just gonna play a very simple kind of um, container musical container okay it's gonna just be simple back and forth mm, let's see I'm going to play it with this hand. That was almost Pink Panther. Yeah. Da -dun, da -dun. <laughs> um, and so I'm just going to play this pattern. Okay. And then when you feel ready, come in and play whatever black keys you want because there's no right or wrong note. Oh, okay. With this. Can I just... Uh... Okay. Yeah, exactly. And as you're playing, you know, you were talking about feeling 
feeling depressed mm -hmm. with the loss of your friend. Yeah. As, as you're playing, see if you can connect to that feeling. Okay. You see, what, what, when we had that little break, one yeah. of the things that we discovered, which I didn't know, was that Kirk loved the blues, and amazingly, he loved Cream. Mm. One of the shortest lived bands in the history of rock, and one of the most remembered named bands in the history of rock, just because of what they were able to produce between the three of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was Eric Clapton, Ginger Baker, Jack Bruce, at the top of their game. Yeah, the remarkable music they came out with. But uh, anyway, okay. And so I wonder how that knowledge is going to influence what you feel the next time you hear their music. Actually, when I get home, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to listen to Spoonful. Because I know that if Kirk really liked Cream, that would be one of his favorites. And maybe even, oh, Train Time as well, because Kirk was so into steam engines. <laughs> nice. So, neat. Okay. So you just want me to, to cut in? Oh, yeah. Oh. Again, there's uh, no me, right me, or wrong. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna watch your fingers for a little bit, see what you, oh, I see. So, I've never played a keyboard. Throw in a white I, key I had to there. throw in a white key. I can't be a black key only man. <laughs> Don't limit me. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Because I was able to keep an eye on what you were doing and sort of try and improv in uh, underneath it. Exactly. Because I, I, being on the high end of the keyboard, it was actually over you, but. And that's the point. And that's the point. Ah. Oh. I'm the music so, that I'm So you're like is background. Mm -hmm. Your background support, and then I'm trying to fill in the little bits and pieces that you get so terribly wrong. I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Uh, <laughs> do you want to try something else? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really getting a good feel for this, and then I think it'll be time to say goodbye. Okay. Okay. So let, let's let's have another little. Do a do a different. Yeah. Can you do a different uh, yeah, key set? Still with black keys, or no? Let's intermingle a little bit. Okay. Okay. Because so. I agree with what you said, the black keys sound so much warmer mm -hmm. rather than the, the, the coldness of... See, that's, that's cold, but that's just There's that little, little bit, bit warmer. warmer. Just gives you that little bit extra. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. So... And that's the first time I've ever played on a keyboard like that. Oop. <laughs> Second time now. Second time now. <laughs> Perfect. If we're going to do... Uh, if we're going to incorporate some black notes, mm -hmm. then we'll be having to define a key signature so that okay. we can make sure that the black notes that you Okay, play now you do realize that that whizzed over my head about as quickly as a software release. So that's why I'm going to make it easy okay. for us. Oh, easy is good. Make this the only black note that you play, whether it's here, here. Here. Oh, so I can do that one, that one, and that one. Yep, and then white keys. And otherwise. then white keys thrown in at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and see, this is a great example of how music can be helpful for those of us who are getting older and needing to, like, getting work, older. On our, work on our memories. Getting old, darling, some of us are already there. <laughs> I'm trying to be diplomatic, <laughs> <Nigel>. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because you're young at heart, clearly. Well, yeah, there is that. <laughs> you mean mentally unstable? No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see what you're doing. Let's... Let's see, what am I doing? No, that's too low. You have to break the rules occasionally. 
I'm going to turn into that character from Sesame Street, the the composer who like, That's right. starts playing that on the piano. Well, what we've just proved to everyone that's watching this video is is I'm not Keith Emerson or Rick Waitman. <laughs> oh well. But what was that like for you? I mean, it given was interesting. what you were saying that. It you don't play. I wish I had had you as a music teacher when I was 13 or 14 mm -hmm. when I first tried to learn the piano because the person that tried to teach me was just, well, these are the chords you need to know. And I'm, yeah. It was not fun. It, it really was not fun. But this, I'm, I'm really getting sort of the feel of it, which of course is what you want out of your patients. Exactly. Is, is to feel what they're doing. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an absolute experience. And uh, I, I, I love what we're doing. And uh, this is really good. And I'm going to go home and listen to Cream. Excellent. I really am. Good. And hopefully there's no one in the house, which means I can run everything at volume 11. <laughs> <laughs> a la Spinal Tap. <laughs> yeah. Faith, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for explaining the behind the scenes of what music therapy really is and all the different facets that it can cover. It's absolutely amazing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Nigel. Thank you. Everybody out there in viewer land, I, I hope you have found this interesting uh, as, a, as a rational therapy. I was unsure on how today was going to go because everything we've talked about in the last 10 minutes is 100% true. I did lose a very dear friend last Friday. And... Uh, I'm actually feeling pretty darn good at the moment. And a lot of that, of course, is uh, because of Faith, her personality, and what she was doing on the keyboard. It was absolutely fascinating. I'm Nigel Aves, your host. We're not quite at the Captain's Lounge Studios at the moment. We're at the Brett Bannerman Studios here in Longmont. See you next time. And uh, we've got a really interesting program coming up for you in the near future. Take good care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.